Hello, everybody. Well, this is quite exciting to actually follow on to Edward Snowden. It's amazing to, uh, amazing to listen to him, and I hope he's doing well in Russia. It's a really tough time these days. Um, well, we're really excited to be up here and talking about L2. I think, um, you know, early on, um, you know, we all kind of recognize that there's only so much you can get out of maximally decentralized layer ones. They're optimized for one core thing, which is providing extremely strong security guarantees. And the trilemma says that although people talk about breaking it all the time, they're making a trade-off in centralization. And fundamentally, you know, we don't want to have to give up one thing in order to get other things. So L2s have, you know, been around since the very beginning. Bitcoin had lightning. Um, it actually hasn't done a lot since then, but Bitcoin in general seems to ossify. So uh, there you go. Uh, that's okay. They don't want to do that. We love, we love protocols uh, in the Ethereum space for sure. Um, so, but in our space, uh, tremendous amount of work on this. Um, how many people, you know, remember a couple years back when it was a real question about what the scaling was going to look like for Ethereum? Do people remember when we thought that state channels were going to be a significant part of scaling? I remember that. I remember it was, you know, state channels have experienced their own little crypto winter because rollups became just so damn good. Uh, how many people in the audience remember when Ethereum did the big pivot into execution environments and, you know, uh, we were going to have arbitrary run times on, uh, on, on Ethereum uh, as like, you know, phase two of the Ethereum 2 roadmap? Who's around? Joe Lubin raised his hand. Okay, good. You've been doing your homework. We've got a few other people here. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting, there's a lot of history here, but you know, now we're at a spot where for people who are entering the space or investing in the space, the future looks really good for scalability. Um, L2s look like an extremely dynamic, awesome solution. Um, we have two uh, people on our panel here which are talking about certain angles of looking at L2s. In a lot of cases, when you'd have an L2 panel, you might have a couple of the well-known execution formats that people are hearing about because they've been raising a lot of money. They're really active about getting users, about getting protocols onto them. And I'll just throw out a few of them. Of course, everybody knows Polygon, you know, Starkware, Optimism, Arbitrum, uh, ZK Sync. I mean, I could go on for a while because literally there's a lot of these different ones out there. And they're all experimenting with these different execution layers. and. Frankly, if we had a panel here of a number of different roll-ups, a lot of the discussion would be about why one roll-up environment is better than the others. So this actually ends up being a really interesting panel because this is a meta L2 panel uh, about the topic of the L2 space at large, not around one roll-up and not around why one roll-up should end up being a winner, but instead, what's the sort of unbundling and how do we think about how L2 grows as an entire e ecosystem? So with that, um, I think, you know, especially if people are newer to the space, this is a great time. You don't have to necessarily learn a lot of the, the history. Ethereum is notable for really doing a lot of searching through different ideas. Um, so I have uh, two people here, uh, one very esteemed, uh, James Presswich. He's an OG. If you can tell me, what year did you start getting involved in blockchain? Uh, I've been full-time in crypto since 2014. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, and would you put yourself as like what what segment of the L two space would you say that you're in? Uh, I've been involved in you know Lightning State Channel Plasma research Rollup research uh, you know on the periphery for uh, as long as L twos have been a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now I work primarily on cross chain communication. Uh, which, when I say chain, I include all of the L2s in that bucket. Uh, functionally, an L2 like Arbitrum or ZK Sync is no different from a blockchain. Uh, so right now, I work on just about as many L2s as I can get my hands on. And um, yeah, you gave a great talk at uh, ETHCC last year where you talked about your experience uh, as part of the team that did IBC on Cosmos, um, which 
you described as an experience that was expected to take how long and how long did it actually take? Uh, you know, I have been a relatively small contributor to IBC. Other people did the bulk of that work, but you know, we started on this as part of the original Cosmos idea back in you know, 2014, 2015. Uh, and back then, you know, everybody thought we could release Lightning and IBC and, you know, a few other things within two to three years tops. Uh, IBC, of course, finally launched, you know, last year. Uh, so it, it took a little longer than expected, I think. Yeah, it has good parallels with Ethereum 2, right? Ethereum 2 in 2015 launched, and if I remember correctly, the expectation was to go to proof of stake in about a year, two years max? Yeah, we, we thought that you know Lightning, IBC, and proof of stake Ethereum, or Serenity as we called it back then, would be launched about the same time, maybe 2016, 2017 at the latest. Okay, and so you, know, you can keep that in mind when you hear somebody like me saying optimistically, we really are going to proof of stake this summer. <laughs> like, for sure. For sure. <laughs> um, I do really believe that. I'm being a little sarcastic, but you know, uh, also people who have said that have been wrong in the past. <laughs> uh, I have a standing bet that the merge will happen in Q2. Uh, we'll see if I lose. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I'll talk with you afterwards on the wager if we pick months. <laughs> Somebody needs to actually, we need a, 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 good, a good crowdsourcing. There probably is. Does anybody know, is there a good sourcing spot where you can place real money on the, the, the uh, merge date? You know, we also thought prediction markets would launch in 2017, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the reasons why I think it's really exciting to have James here uh, chatting with us on this is that there's a perspective around L2s and there's this sort of uh, view that you get a lot of times, especially on the investor side. How many people in this audience are more on the investor side versus tech side? Okay, all right, we've got a decent, decent amount here. Um, so there's you know, uh, a definite mentality around winner takes all. Um, it's very kind of exciting and it looks early on like you're gonna have something that you know, takes an entire new market. Um, and definitely you know, there are great reasons why particular um, L2s of various forms can look like they're dramatically better. Um, but Ultimately, across the system, what's, uh, I, you know, this is my opinion, I think James shares it since he works in it so much, but, um, you know, bridging and the ability to have hyper-liquid ability to move value and to coordinate state across systems becomes more important than having one winner in a new space. And so, we're gonna kind of dive into that a little more. But before we dive into that some more, I'll introduce, I think he's gonna be new for almost everybody here um, although a number of us have worked with him for a while. Sri Ram Kanan, uh, I'll do the bio intro so you don't have to do it. So he's, he recently got his tenureship at University of Washington, so round of applause for him. No small feat with, you know, half of the people getting involved in crypto deciding to drop out of high school or college, and then virtually nobody making it through a PhD. Although I saw somebody recently, he was at NYU, and he's doing a great protocol, and he says he's actively in the PhD. So when I meet him, I'll find out if that's true or not. Um, so yeah, so he, he did all of the hard work. Um, he's not new to the crypto space in 20, did you start in 2017 or 2018? 2018, 2018 um, he collaborated along with another really great professor at Stanford. There's a couple of like key people that work. One, his name is David C on a protocol called PRISM. Uh, if anybody ever wants to see like a very beautiful protocol which is influencing now in some ways parts of ETH2, but something that actually took apart the kind of latency and the throughput issues of large P2P networks of um, validators and figured out how to uh, unbundle those two in a way that Ethereum is doing, but I would actually say PRISM is even more elegant. Um, he worked on that, but through the crypto winter, uh, what happened to Prism? <laughs> um, we did have a protocol implementation of Prism called Trifecta, yeah, which is an academic project and yeah. uh, you know free for anybody to build on. Yeah, this is where timing comes into play because literally, you know, really strong L1 protocol. We, we tried raising money for Trifecta in 2019 uh, from um, April sometime. Yeah. 
And then the thing you used to hear from all the investors is, hey, you're going to run 100,000 transactions per second, but ETH ha is not even running or using five transactions per second. Where is all these new transactions coming from? We didn't have an answer to that. We just knew how to build very fast blockchains. So, you know, if real estate is location, 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 investing is timing, timing, timing. And yeah, the timing was not right there. <laughs> but through that process, so, uh, you know, Sriram, David C., and others, they're information theoretic professors. They know a tremendous amount about coding theory. Coding theory ends up being extremely powerful, cri crypto economic protocols, because it allows you to trade off on latencies and other things. And so, um, why don't you tell us about what you're working on in the L2 space? And I'm gonna put in, just so people get the right buying set, there's a concept around this. Think of the word unbundling, okay? Like, you have the idea that we had monolithic chains like Bitcoin initially and Ethereum initially is also that, you know, did everything. It had to do transaction ordering, it had to do security bonding, it had to do data availability, data storage, data propagation, um, and, you know, having all of that together definitely allowed things to launch but as you try to scale, the bundling kind of falls under its own weight. So there's an aspect of unbundling here that uh, Sriram is working on right now at the L2 side. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll start a little bit uh, earlier. You know, my uh, interest in blockchain started only in 2018, but my interest in peer-to-peer -peer networks goes way back. This was part of my PhD thesis. We were working on peer-to-peer -peer wireless networks and trying to see how you can build high-speed uh, wireless networks where you don't have any coordination layer. It turned out, you know, by the time I finished my thesis in 2012, uh, infrastructure for wireless networks was very well deployed, so the requirement for purely peer-to-peer -peer wireless went away, so to say. And it's interesting to see things like uh, Helium come back up with a twist on the basic premise of peer-to-peer -peer wireless. Instead of being peer-to-peer, -peer, you have a pool and you have infrastructure being distributedly supplied. So uh, when I heard about the throughput and latency problems in Bitcoin back in 2018, we were super excited to see we can bring all that knowledge of peer-to-peer -peer networks to uh, Bitcoin. Okay, so this, uh, so to address what we're doing in the L2 space, let's zoom back a little and understand why blockchains are, uh, uh, why blockchains are monolithic in the first place. So if you, if you look at the core value proposition of blockchains, one of the really big things going on is at the DAP layer, at the smart contract layer, it's entirely permissionless. Somebody can come in without any reputation, without any uh, prior backing, they can come and launch new distributed applications and the blockchain supplies trust. So you can think of the blockchain as a trust supplier to the smart contracts. However, and, and this has led to a massive permissionless innovation. Anybody can come and compete on creating dApps. That's why we see uh, you know, kids launch massive derivatives protocols. However, this does not extend when you go deeper into the blockchain stack. The smart contract layer is entirely permissionless. As you go deeper, suppose you have a better consensus protocol, like we thought we did. There's no way to create a system and compete permissionlessly on consensus protocols, unless you create your own new token. Every new protocol idea needs to have its own token that then securitizes it. This is a very, very inefficient system. So this is not only true at the very core layer of the blockchain protocols, like consensus, data availability. You go one level up, you wanna build things like oracles, authentication engines. All of these need their own tokens to underwrite security. If I could just interrupt for one second, just to bring this concrete to people, because when we say security and other stuff, it gets a little bit of these abstract things. But like, think about the fact that if you're in Chainlink, and you want to provide security and staking around the new federated model, you've got to have enough value at stake within the tokenized system to be able to provide that. Think about Celestia providing data availability and the staking, at least as it is currently in there, is based around the value that's in the Celestia system. Think about the data availability that's in Validium and Volition systems for data availability for lower cost ZK rollup systems, 
And those data availability councils need to have some ability that there's a slashing penalty for people doing bad behavior. Because remember, protocols are about getting people to want to do the right thing, and you get them to do it by a carrot and a stick. And you know, the beauty of, beauty of proof of stake systems is you can slash as much as I love proof of work. Well, I don't love it for the power, but I love it for the permissionless. But you know, proof of work systems can only give you a carrot. The stick is actually quite low, and attacks have a problem that if you succeed with an attack, there's actually not even cost. Proof of the stake systems allow you to do slashing. So what we're talking about here in a concrete sense is, you know, what is the alternative to having lots of little one, two, three, five, ten billion dollar pools of you know value in these different environments that of course are being accumulating value in the actual transaction system or the service that's being applied, but then they're being used for security and they're pretty small because if you look at Ethereum, Ethereum's at you know three, four, five hundred billion. I personally think after proof of stake goes live, we're gonna flip on Bitcoin, maybe even two, three X, you know, time frame. Doesn't say that Ethereum's gonna go up because maybe there's a crypto winter, but I just think it's happening at that point. It makes a lot of sense to me. But you know, what do I know? Um, so anyway, okay, that's my side on the concrete side, thinking about the security pools and that, you know, providing the the belief that we have that the slashing is meaningful in these services. Absolutely. So what is happening in these ecosystems today is that it is the flow of trust that makes blockchains monolithic. The stakers put their money down and commit to providing block creation in, let's say, the Ethereum proof of stake ecosystem. And once they do that, they are liable to do it correctly. If not, they get slashed. And this trust only flows for block making. What, what does block making comprise of? Transaction ordering, transaction execution, and data availability. So they're only providing, firstly, these three services. Secondly, they're only able to provide these three services at the, with the particular protocol integrated in, into the uh, core Ethereum uh, ecosystem. So traditionally, if you, if you look at blockchain governance, it, there is a core problem there. The core problem is that the blockchain requires upgrades to be anonymous. All of us have to agree what the next version of Ethereum is. All the stakers have to agree, continue to, mi to migrate into that. So anonymous governance means you know, it provides long-range stability. We make sure that everything is right before it gets in, but it does not provide short-term agility, you know, cannot adapt. People cannot compete on different variants of the protocol in order to find which is the best one. So a, a particularly poignant example is the example of sharding versus rollups. Sharding was a mechanism which needed a consensus upgrade. We need to upgrade the Ethereum consensus protocol to support sharding, as opposed to rollups were a mechanism for absorbing trust from the existing Ethereum layer and creating a permissionless competition. And we see that the difference between the two is like night and day. One requires an upgrade, and since only one upgrade can go in, we have to debate a lot about what's the correct version of the upgrade. The other one, the roll-ups, are a permissionless innovation. People can compete on what the best technology is. And our thesis at Layer Labs, which is a startup I've been uh, trying to build over the last year, is that we need to bring permissionless innovation to every stack of the blockchain ecosystem. How do we bring it? And uh, that, that's our core technology called Eigenlayer. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, is it, you know, nowhere in there did you say the word restaking. Uh, yep, so I, I'll explain what Eigenlayer, how Eigenlayer actually achieves this end goal. The end goal is to unbundle trust from only being used for block making in Ethereum to taking the trust and letting the stakers provide additional services. When you're providing these additional services, you have to, in order to actually get economic trust from it, you need to subject yourself as a staker to additional sticks as a uh, as Robert put it, which is additional potential penalties if you did the wrong thing on those additional services. So what we need is for the Ethereum stakers or any blockchain stakers for that matter to not only commit to providing blocks in the core layer, but also 
leveraging that existing staking to now provide additional services. And the mechanism to do that is we have a smart contract system called Eigenlayer, which is fundamentally allows restaking. What is restaking? Restaking is taking your existing stake, which has been committed to provide blocks in Ethereum, and then subjecting it to additional slashing conditions, potentially, for providing these additional validation services. And why would you do it? What is the incentive for you to do it? By providing these additional validation services, you earn additional rewards. And the free market that, that's associated with this unleashes a variety of untapped resources. For example, in Ethereum, or in any blockchain, it's designed to be homogeneous, which means all stakers have to do the same thing. And so blockchains have to be designed for the lowest common denominator. Let's say if there are like 20,000 stakers in Ethereum and the least one you, the entry, the least one has one megabytes per second connection. Now you have to design the entire system for one megabytes per second. In the meanwhile, let's say 30% 30, 30 of the stakers have access to a 10 gigabytes per second connection. That's an untapped resource that you cannot use because blockchains have been designed based on a homogeneity, based on the least common denominator. What we are trying to do is to unleash the additional abilities that are, that are currently untapped, which is this, some subset of stakers may have way more block gas limit, so to say. Right? The gas limit is a mechanism for deciding how much computation we, we are allowing on the network. But for the top 30% stakers, maybe they can allow like 100x more gas limit. Yeah. It's okay. a great argument. Yeah, well, well, Eigenlayer does this in a specific way. Uh, unbundling the services that the chain provides uh, is really the entire project of layer two. And we classify all of these layer twos based on which services they consume and which they unbundle and provide their own or outsource to someone else. Uh, so we talk a lot about channels. Channels are going to consume the chain's execution, but not the chain's data availability, and they're going to use different validators, and they're going to have a different, uh, maybe even a different execution layer. Uh, Rollups use data availability, so they put their data into the chain, but they don't necessarily use the chain's execution, and they have a subset of the chain's validators. They pick and choose which validators they want to use. Uh, Every L2 is essentially you know, classified by which parts of the core, the layer one, does it keep, does it use, and which part does it provide on its own or adjust or select a different trade-off. Thank you, that's very, very helpful. Um, so yeah, we definitely have a lot of cerebral tech power on this panel. <laughs> um, one thing that I'll say, uh, do you mind if I give a summary of something that I consider people should as a takeaway about, so Nomad protocol, uh, which is what James is working on currently. It's a specific kind of bridging protocol, and like I said, for L2, there's the people who are sort of focused on the execution game of what you have in a particular chain, and I'll make a comment about that in a second, but there's a specific thing that Nomad does, and let me try to encapsulate in like an elevator pitch, which is that it allows you to optimistically, meaning very quickly, be able to transfer not just value, but state from one chain or one of these L2 runtimes to another and back and forth. And it does it in a way that allows you to atomically settle transaction pairs that are happening across those two chains, which if you think about it is the composable feature of a single ledger. And by allowing you to do this across L2 chains, it brings that composability in a way that allows cross-chain AMMs and all sorts of really interesting applications in that space. So, you know, very cool. And, uh, you know, an ability to actually kind of unbundle the need for us to have a single L2 that, you know, wins them all. Yeah, well, that, that's really the core problem of L2s, isn't it? Is that they, they aren't Ethereum. Uh, they aren't the L1. Uh, optimism and Arbitrum and all these things, they're not scaling Ethereum. They're making a second system on top of it that you can opt into using in addition to Ethereum. Uh, you can't natively interoperate between Arbitrum and Ethereum or between Optimism and Ethereum. You have to go through this process of bridging your assets over, bridging your state over, sending messages between these different domains that are isolated. 
so that's really what we work on is how do you send these messages? How do you have a you know, high degree of certainty that they'll get there and that they'll get there in a timely manner? And how do you behave in the meantime as if they had already arrived and already been executed? Uh, how can we provide very fast guarantees on communication and asset transfer between chains, between L2s, uh, no matter what the architecture is, no matter whether it's a roll up or a state channel or something else? Yes, and while there might be, in order for, for the speed up, some level of centralization, ultimately the trust is fully decentralized, which is right. the, core, the core aspect of the mm. Ethereum view. Uh, the fun thing about the speed up is that you actually offsource it to uh, risk tolerant parties. Right. Uh, you know, you're gonna have someone fill your order uh, in advance of the order reaching the other chain. Um, so you're going to use a liquidity provider that will lend you the money on the receiving chain after you've sent it on the sending chain, but before it arrives. Uh, and you're going to pay them a small fee for use of their liquidity. So um, I'd like to hit two questions that are a little bit more on the monetary value side away from the technology. And I'll just ask them, and I have some opinions too, but I'd like to hear from the panelists. One is, are the roll-ups that we're all hearing about really customer acquisition channels and not really about the technology? Uh, I think all of the roll-ups that we hear about are brand plays and not technology plays. Uh, the technology is baseline good across all of them, and what people are using or care about is all branding. What do you think, Sriram? I don't have a strong uh, understanding of that, but I <laughs> Well, I'll say one of my proofs for why I think that to be true is that if you talk with people that are doing optimistic roll-ups, I believe the strong thesis for them is that once they've captured the DeFi apps, the dApps, the users, the accounts, the total value locked, they can fork into a ZK roll-up or they can fork into anything they want. So it's really about capturing a network of people who believes in the brand and believes in the team. So we're back to the human trust equation. Uh, I think this is where something like Nomad plays a very significant role because what uh, the value capture or any of the rollups is fundamentally the composability that is inherent inside of the rollup to the extent that the composability interoperates across rollups and the latency is reduced then there is no limited or bounded value capture which is only serving inside the rollup, but it will interoperate across all other rollup. Well, the goal is to you know, bring that value from each individual ecosystem and move it up one layer so that all ecosystems share all value. Um, in terms of uh, rollup specifically, you know, now that optimism has changed architecture, uh, technically on a low level, Arbitrum and Optimism are the same system now, right. just different implementations. Uh, they now use the exact same tech. Optimism uh, you know, picked up Arbitrum's design a few months back. Um, so we've seen kind of convergence of the optimistic rollups into the same model. Uh, the ZK rollups are generally speaking very similar designs. Uh, I think we're seeing things really settle down uh, and we're going to be, you know, like within a few years, we're going to know what the correct roll-up models are mm -hmm. for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And one final point, I think we're gonna run out of time to actually discuss it here, but so people just know it's out there. We talked about this before the panel, and if you wanna chat with us afterwards, there's this issue of, you know, are valuations getting ahead of the skis on roll-ups? We're hearing a bunch of roll-ups that are going to the billions there's an interesting interplay here. You know, people complain about Ethereum layer one fees, and there's that old adage about the nightclub that's so popular, it's so crowded that no one goes there anymore. So, so you know, the key value that keeps getting promoted about a lot of these systems, whether it's Polygon or Solana or others, or how inexpensive, how damn inexpensive the fees are, and the question comes into, is there gonna be enough volume to support the valuations or not? That's sort of uh, an interesting topic. It's about whether you know investors and others often will do this. There's no question there's a tremendous value. It's just an inter interesting question about what's the right intersection point. And um, well, you know, wag me, it's gonna be fine. But uh, just you know, pay attention to valuations. I'm, you know, I, I put away my belief of revenues to a certain degree, especially in the last year or two, but Ultimately, the potential energy of hype converts to the 
to the kinetic energy of revenues in some way. So I do look at the monetization and what it looks like. So feel free, we'll do that as an after talk for anybody who wants to chat with any of us because we did have some opinions about that too. I so don't know if I have time for one question. Yeah, we can squeeze in a question from the audience. Okay, great. I see a gentleman over here. Yeah, awesome chat, guys. Thank you so much. And it's like the perfect overlap with Edward Snowden. You know, he's talking about the need for financial privacy. Tornado cash is super fucking expensive. If we can make that cheaper, things will be very good, and humans around the globe can use this tech. So uh, roll-ups in L2 are part and parcel of that. Yeah. Uh, so my question pertains to some roadmap stuff. You know, we I think a lot of us are optimistic that, sure, your guys' is optimism that the merge will happen in the not-too-distant future. If you look further out on the roadmap, we have sharded data availability as part of the Ethereum sort of protocol. Um, not execution, but a data availability. Uh, my question pertains to cross-chain communication in that environment. Uh, will the advent of, quote, native uh, data availability in Ethereum, uh, will that facilitate easier or cheaper cross-chain communication? Or is it kind of orthogonal? It doesn't really impact that, that aspect of, uh, of scaling. Um, so first up is, uh, I think that like proof of stake and sharding and most other systems, Ethereum's gonna get scooped by a fast mover on data availability. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's Eigenlayer or Celestia or someone else, uh, Ethereum's not gonna be first to market here. Uh, so the question you know, then is, what can data availability do for cross-chain communication? And it's kind of interesting because in a sense, just you know, like publishing attestations of chain state, you know, just putting out a statement and saying that this is true is enough for cross-chain communication in most places. So what we really need is to make all of these you know, attestations public permanently so that we can have a uh, you know, visible public record of what's been done in cross-chain communication. Uh, so data availability is going to be great for that. Right now, each chain provides its own data availability and we use that on each chain. It would be great to have one data availability system where everything is that's an immutable public history of this. Just but as a PSA, I need to remind people that it gets often completely conflated, data availability and data storage. Data availability is just an ephemeral proof that the data was published. It doesn't mean that unless there's another system, you could ever find it again, unless you kept it yourself. So there's a whole nother layer around data, which is the storage side. One brief comment on it is, again, this uh, notion of monolithic versus competitive, uh, which is, you know, instead of Ethereum itself necessarily being the own one data availability source, if many, many people compete on providing data availability by borrowing the trust, we will see a much more interesting dynamic where people don't have to necessarily create a new token just for creating a new technology. But I should say people will create a new token to capture the governance of the Absolutely. value that Absolutely. they are producing in their layer. It's just that they won't conflate the governance in the token with things that it doesn't need to do. And create a new token to capture the funding round. <laughs> yeah. I think we're moving away the difference from between DAP tokens, which are not security underwriting versus, you know, tokens that actually underwrite security. Like the Uniswap tokens value is zero. Still, the Uniswap system is very secure. It just captures upside on potential fees that the system can extract. Yeah. Thanks, guys.